Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am so excited to introduce my guest today, somebody who's been in the background of a lot of this podcast and maybe hasn't even known it. Uh, I have Leah Spasova on the podcast today, uh, and we've known of each other for a while through the sex experts business community, which we're going to talk about in a second. But before that, uh, how are you doing today? Well, Rachel, it's great to be here. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Um, and to start off, we'll have you just start off by talking a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Uh, how did you get involved in this work? Uh, how did you start the Sexperts business community? And uh, why are you here today? Amazing. Well, the long story short is that I'm a psychologist and I specialize in sex and relationships. And when I started my business, it was a, a struggle to run a business in that field. Not only that I had no business education, but I had a negative business mindset and I wasn't thrilled about building a business. And I struggled a lot, even though I dove into learning, it wasn't easy. And it was only after I started hanging out with professionals in my own field that I realized that between us, we have a lot of knowledge and kind of by accident started the sex and business community. It wasn't planned. It wasn't something that I had a mindset to build, so to speak. But it is the reason why my private practice was able to be built and built successfully as well. Incredible. Yeah. And it's uh, how, when did you start this experts business community? 2019. 2019. Today is March and we actually like turned five years today. Well, not today, but this month. Oh, wow. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. Wow. Five years. Yeah. And I, I've been using it almost since the beginning of my podcast, which started in 2020. And um, do you want to give people an overview of what the Sexperts business community is? Yeah, so it's a business community for sex and relationship professionals. We don't have the same infrastructures and support that mainstream businesses do have. And it's a place where if you're a sexuality professional, you can meet colleagues, you can exchange advice, you can hang out with people that really get you so you're not so isolated in your own little bubble. And we do create resources and support that can really help you improve your business practices, scale your work, and reach more people, help more people. So it's all about community getting together, working together, and making it better for the industry, but also in terms of access for the general public, because we're not that many. And sadly, the general public doesn't even know we exist for the most part. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sex education is an interesting field and the lack of access to it, which we will be talking about today, um, is very interesting. So it's been an amazing resource for me as I am learning, um, you know, the podcast ropes and trying to get in contact with different sexperts. Um, somebody called me a sexpert recently, which was like a huge honor. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's so nice. Um, but uh, being part of the community and being able to talk to people who all have the same passions and desires to share and learn from each other has just been really, I mean, there, there's nothing like it and it's been incredible. So thank you for creating it. Well, thank you for being part of it. You know, it's because professionals that it exists without us getting together, it's nothing. <laughs> it's yeah. Not a community. Yeah, and um, that kind of leads into today's topic. Today, we're going to be talking about censorship and mm -hmm. how difficult it can be to be a, a sexpert in this world of the internet um, or to be somebody who is seeking information um, to learn about sex, the body, anatomy, themselves, um, and are having a find hard time finding those resources. Um, so here's a, here's a question that I think is fun to kind of start with this topic, which is, uh, what do you remember about your sex ed? <laughs> if, if you had any in school, I know some people didn't even have it. 
No, I'm originally from Bulgaria and we had okay. no sex ed. We've had biology classes, but even then I don't remember studying anything about sex. It was mainly like, this is the human body. <laughs> you know, these are the parts of the body, that's it. Kind of, and that was in what, fifth, sixth grade, meaning 12, 13 years old, mm -hmm. 14. No, it's definitely not 14. But yeah, we had no sex ed at all in my school. And in Bulgaria, it's still very much like not a thing. Mm -hmm. Taboo. Yeah. But very actually, taboo. Actually, I think that it's better to not have any sex ed than have shit sex ed. I completely agree. Mm. I completely agree. We had some at my school, um, but it was very much like when a man and a woman love each other, the penis goes here and this is what happens inside the body, how babies are made. But it's never focused on pleasure, which is the majority of the reason why people are having sex. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just think it's an interesting question to figure out. So when did you learn more about sex? I've been learning about sex since the beginning of my own time. Um, yeah? Yeah. I mean, I was lucky to grow up in a sex-positive family, especially my dad. He didn't want me to be brought up in an environment that just stigmatized and instilled shame or guilt or something. So I don't, I've never had the talk. I've never had like, sit down and here's your education about sex and relationships. It was more like any child of three, four, five, ten years old would have questions. And my questions were just answered as a matter of fact, not as a, where did you hear this from? You're too young to ask this. Um, ask me when you grow up a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, none of that. It was literally like, here's a question. He would answer as a matter of fact, if I had more questions, I'll ask, but he would, my dad was really good at answering very simple, um, not giving too much and diving into as if he's lecturing or anything like this. It was more like, here's a question. Here's an answer. If you want to know more, ask more questions kind of thing. So that to me is more like stage appropriate education rather than mm. age appropriate because the kid would ask questions at any point and you can just kind of like give them as much as they're asking for because most kids are like they get an answer and they're like huh okay and they move on and go play hide and seek or whatever kids do nowadays but <laughs> um yeah it was more like stage appropriate education there wasn't sit down and this is sex kind of talk. Yeah, I got that talk. My mom did a really good job with it. But I like that idea stage appropriate versus age appropriate. Because that way the child is coming to you and telling you what they're ready to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Versus you deciding when they're ready to learn it. Yeah. And um I have done sex education in schools like delivering. And I walk into a room of 14, 15 year olds and trust me, they're the kids that are absolutely terrified of being there. Like, oh my God, I don't want to learn anything here. I, I am not ready. I don't want to hear anything. It feels so uncomfortable. One group of kids, the other group of kids are like, oh, miss, do you know this word? <laughs> Blah, some kind of random term that they've just figured out. You know, they're so switched on. They want to talk about it. They want to learn about it. They're at a different stage. They may be the same age. But in their development and readiness to learn and openness to learning, they're at a very different stage. Yeah. No, that's a very, very good point. And I think so important to keep in mind. And that's why in many ways having the kid come to you with questions is more impactful because they tell you what they're ready for. Yeah. Huh. That's really fascinating. Yeah. I remember my sex ed class. Um... My parents had told me about, my mom, my mom had told me about sex before um, and was able to kind of do it in a way that was relatable to me because I started masturbating at a very young age. And so, you know, she was like, she told me, you know, this is what it is physiologically. And I was like, why would anybody do that? That sounds uncomfortable. That sounds awful. And she was like, well, it feels a lot like pushing your button. And I was like, oh, never mind. I'm all on board. Like, <laughs> That's great. I want to do that. So let's, let's, yep, I'm ready for that. And she was like, I would, 
I would appreciate it if you waited till marriage. But if you, you know, determine that you do not want to do that, that's okay. But I want you to be safe. So, so, so come talk to me. And as soon as she told me that it was like what I experienced, I was like, I'm not waiting till marriage. Absolutely mm. not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how, how my experience went. But uh, my parents were very, very positive. You know, having a, a three or four year old who does that um, in public no less. That's a really good opportunity. A lot of parents would take that opportunity to shame yeah. their kid. And my parents didn't. They just were like, this is something that we do. It's okay to do. We do it when we're by ourselves in our room, when we have private time. Um, but it's it's not something, it's something that is for us. It's, you know, for for you, not us. That sounds weird. But it's something that for is private for you. Um, other people don't need to be involved in it. So Really excellent parenting there. Mm. Um, I think a lot of parents would have taken, flipped out and, and really put a lot of early shame into their kid's life. Yeah. So I'm glad that they didn't do that. Um, okay, so we're going to be talking a little bit about sex ed. It's funny. I feel like we're, we're going back to a lot of topics that I learned about in school. Sex ed and censorship. So let's get into it. How big question to start. How does censorship impact people's individual sex lives? Oh, wow. I know. Big, big one. <laughs> wow. Oh, Jesus. Well, it's, it's massive. It's massive because it actually prevents us from enjoying ourselves, from having healthy relationships, from building good self-esteem, from having a good relationship with ourselves as well. And not only that, it doesn't end there, but a lot of health conditions, especially female health conditions, don't receive enough attention as it is. And then when you add censorship to it, people don't understand what's happening to their bodies. They think that it's normal to be in pain, for instance, when they have sex or when they're on their period or to bleed three weeks out of four every month or whatever. And they don't get help. And this is how relationships fall apart. When one person is struggling the whole time and the other one is like, so the last time we had sex was three months ago. <laughs> and specifically it happens to women. They've been in pain the majority of this time. They've been struggling the majority of this time. When they have sex, it's not comfortable. It's not pleasurable. And then people are wondering, why is there a crisis in sex? Why are people having less sex than ever before and I'm like because we're stressed we're overworked we don't have access to health care we are not looking after ourselves communities have fallen apart in the past people had a lot more close friends close-knit communities that they would seek advice from and help from because there wasn't the internet the internet now means you go and google shit on your own yeah. And good luck if you can find information. If not, you're on your own. But Google in the past was all your aunties, cousins, friends, neighbors, your mom, your mom's friends, etc. Older sisters, older brothers. That was your Google mm -hmm. before. That's such a good point. There's been like a, a familial... Learning about sex used to be very family oriented. You would talk to your family about it, talking about relationships, but now people's first instinct is to go to Google, which is so impersonal. It's not only impersonal, it's very redacted. It's very much edited. A lot yeah. of the information that you should be able to get does not reach you because of algorithms, because of censorship, because of companies like Facebook and Google completely silencing content creators, experts, uh, companies that want to promote healthy solutions and tools and products that would help your intimate life, that would help your relationships and so forth. A lot of relationships fall apart because the sex life is not great. And why is your mm -hmm. sex life not great? Because you didn't get the opportunity to receive the information that was vital for you to build a great sex life. I work in private practice. I have couples that come to me that have struggled for 5, 10, 20 years. 
and I need to kind of like put them on a sex diet. And people are like, why would you put a sexless couple on a sex diet? And I'm like, because the foundation on which they built their sex life is terrible. It does not work. So for us to destroy it, we need to stop it, examine it, and rebuild. And you can't run with it for as long as you've stopped and examined what's going on. If your shoes are falling apart and you're still running, it would make sense to stop for a second, grab new shoes, keep on running, right? That is such a good way of putting it. And I kind of realize that that's what I'm doing right now. Like in my own personal life is is a little bit of like a sex diet. I've realized that the way that I've been operating hasn't been working. You know, I have a lot of curiosity, but I have a tendency to shocker intellectualize everything, mm-hmm. including sex. Um, and so I'm doing a little bit of like, of like a, a pause and relearning how to get in touch with my body or get in touch with my desire, come to terms with some, you know, incidents from my past that have impacted me in this way. So I, that's like a total aside, but I, I hear what you're saying and I, I see how it can be beneficial, even though people might say like, well, if they're not having sex, why would you like stop them from having sex? It's like, no, you have to, when we are getting bad information from the internet or from, you know, people, you need to stop like you said, with the running shoes, you need to stop, you need to reevaluate, and then start rebuilding correctly. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of the time, we don't have good relationship with our own bodies. That's because, mm-hmm. unfortunately, society, media, and whatnot has made it very difficult to lo- love ourselves because that's not profitable. You no. can't monetize, you know, happy people with happy body image and all of that. My industry, you know, sex and relationship therapists and coaches, etc., therapy wouldn't exist if we were built better from the start, if we were built to, and I mean like character built and socially built and established to love ourselves, to speak our truth, to set boundaries, to make smart decisions that honor our values and respect others in the same time. If we had that kind of education from the get-go, my field, the mental health field, would not exist. And in a perfect world, that's what I'm aiming for. <laughs> right. You yeah. want like therapy to be completely negated. Don't need it. Everybody's happy. <laughs> yeah, basically. And I think that... And I'm, yeah, people need help, but yeah. I get what you mean. Yeah, but I think that that's the thing. When you when you have these kind of basics and you are at a healthy level with yourself, then you can engage in personal development a lot more. So maybe therapy and uh, coaching wouldn't disappear. They'll just evolve with people, but it will be a completely different experience. Because right now, therapy is a lot about fixing broken people. Mm-hmm. And why are they broken? Because they didn't get the right education. They Google something and they can't find the right information. They Mm -hmm. continue suffering because they are ashamed. They feel guilty. They don't have anybody to talk to about it. They may have tried to go to a mainstream therapist and they couldn't help them with sex and relationships because guess what? Most professionals in the mental health field had had one day, maybe two, a Freud I mean, Freud is dead, so dead, you know. <laughs> and proven not accurate all the time. <laughs> Nobody's accurate all the time, but my point is most mainstream professionals uh, in the mental health field are not equipped to deal with sex and relationship issues. And that's another thing that puts people in a bad situation because they go to a mainstream professional, they can't get the help, and they feel like, they're helpless, they're hopeless, and there's no way out of this. And let's just end the relationship, move on, and basically repeat the same cycle. Repeat the cycle. Yeah. Yep. I'm very familiar with that. Yeah, and it's um if people had the opportunity to go to the internet and to actually realize that there's a plethora of good information out there that can help them to fix these issues, the world would be a better place. But people are being 
are not able to access this information easily because websites are really terrified of sex for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't get it. I really don't get it. Why are companies like Facebook and Google and many others just so afraid of our sexual liberation and our sexual happiness? I mean, it's why all of us are here. Yeah. All this thing. Like, it's it's something that everybody, maybe not everybody, I recognize that there are people who are asexual or people who are celibate by choice, but the majority of people do. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's it's the most normal thing in the world, really. Um, so why are we why are we stigmatizing it so much and making it such a taboo? I think the honest uh, answer to that is power. People in power want to control I... this. And when you control how people feel about something, you control the flow of information. You control how they experience life. I've never met a dude that was ever ashamed to talk about football. I've never met a woman who was ashamed of talking about cooking. Mm -mm. Why? Because this is normal. You know, it's, yeah. we talk about football and cooking every day. It's no drama. It's like something that we do to enjoy. We do because we need it, right? And to me, because of that sex positive approach from my dad, especially, is that sex is a need. No different to feeding yourself, drinking. Um, it's a need for entertainment, for connection like going to the cinema or whatever, you're just doing it with somebody or on your own. Come on, you've gone to the cinema with a friend. You've binged a TV series on Netflix by yourself, right? You've had a meal Absolutely. with a friend. You've had a meal in bed at home, like alone, because you needed it, you wanted it. And that's sex to me. It's like just part of life. But the people in power make money and have control over us when we don't have access to information, when we feel ashamed. And so people live in misery, in suffering, and their lives are fucked because of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah understatement. And it's, it's interesting out there, like, so I recently had a YouTube video get taken down. And um, they told me that it was because they haven't had issues with any of my other videos, but this video had a link to um, this Literatica website. And they made me take this, YouTube made me take this like training on like what's appropriate and what's not. And what it, I feel like it comes down to is sex for the purposes of learning is fine. If it's about sexual pleasure, no, it's a no-go. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to access it. Why do you think that is? Have you watched The Handmaid's Tale? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have. <laughs> well, if anyone wants to know why, well, they should just go watch that TV series. because, Or, or read the book. But I actually think the TV series is better than the book. That's very rare of me to say that a series or a film is better than the book but the they went a few steps ahead to yeah. kind of like amplify the repercussions and and what it means to hold sex in your hand as power and tell people what they're allowed to do with their bodies and what they're not what is okay what isn't and if you if you look at what's happening in the states right now with abortion rights, uh, contraception rights, etc., I'm like, you tell me that this is not about power. What? It's terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think that this is not, and the other thing that I want to highlight about this is that somehow men are not involved as much, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Don't you know? It takes two to create a baby, first of all. But then, yeah. uh, wait a second. Wait a second, dude. You're so involved. And it's going to be so painful for you. Because this woman would be forced to have your child. Guess what? She will have to take you to court if necessary. Make you do a paternity test if you're disputing that this child is yours. 
and then sue you for child support for the next 18 years. You tell me that this is not affecting men. I tell you, you're stupid. Yeah, that's a good point. It is. It's in a different way, right? It's, it's, it's a loss of autonomy, but not physical bodily autonomy. Yeah. The same way that it is for, for women, for sure. But that was, that was going to be my next question. Like, how do misogyny and sexism play, to, play into this issue of censorship? I mean, like, Viagra is literally on billboards mm -hmm. here in the States. It's on, like, it's, so women can't breastfeed in public because breasts are inherently sexual, even though that's not the primary purpose of them. But Viagra, men keeping their dicks hard, is like totally fine to just advertise on a, on a billboard really yeah well again it's sexist towards women but i want to highlight again that men suffer from that mm -hmm. men suffer and shoot themselves in the dick all the fucking time i tell my clients when they do it themselves i tell my friends if they ever do it and i catch them in it i tell everybody every single dude how they're shooting themselves in the dick and the thing is that men should care that the men at the top that are limiting access to abortion, limiting access to healthcare for women, limiting access to um, contraception as well, is these people in power that are making these decisions are fucking up sex for you, dude. Because next thing is, your girlfriend would not want to have more sex with you. Your girlfriend or whoever you met last night is not going to go bearpacking with you because they're like, yeah, if you give me anything, I can't afford the health care. The risks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it would be so insane to think that men are not impacted by this. They are. So you, dear dude who's listening, <laughs> if you think that it's not your business, that it's a female issue or whatever it is, you're so wrong. You're so wrong because, as I said, women's access to healthcare and contraception is absolutely vital and key to how we make decisions about hooking up, sleeping with people, even with our partners. Yeah. So next time 100%. you go, yeah, dude. Next time you go vote, don't vote for the people that are shooting your girlfriend down in terms of health and uh, access to you, literally like contraception and whatnot. Don't vote for these people because it will shoot you in the dick. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting too, that the people who are making these laws, and I'm talking about a very specific, I mean, I'm talking about a lot of Republican men, mm. like honestly, but I'm talking about one orange Republican in particular. Um, the people at the top, the Republicans at the top, have gotten their mistresses, girlfriends, wives, one night stands, they've gotten them abortions. The people there, it's, it's so hypocritical because these people who are desperate to control with this like it's like under this, that's what it is under this like mirage of family values or whatever. They are able to get those things for themselves mm -hmm. and be hypocrites, but they want to limit that access to other people to control. Yeah. And if you're wondering why would they do that, it's because when you, let's say that you're the average American, let's say that you're middle class. Next thing is you have a hook up this Friday, two months down the line, three months down the line, this girl calls you and is like, gotta have a baby. I don't want it, but we gotta do this. Next thing is, how much of your money is going for child support? How much of her labor is going for child rearing? And everybody's going screaming about, oh, we are not having enough babies in the West. Well, guess what they're doing to make you have those babies and pay for yeah. them? Mm -hmm. They are taking your rights to choose when you become a parent. Male, female, doesn't matter. A child in the States right now and in the UK, where I am based, costs about a quarter of a million. And that statistics from like a few years ago, when we 
you know, check in with inflation and all of that, it will be more like a third of a million now. Yeah. So think twice before you vote, because whilst women's rights are taken away, yours are too. Yours are under fire as well. And with all of that censorship, it's the same people that are in power that enact this censorship so that professionals like myself, like everybody in the business community that we have, cannot reach you with information, cannot reach you and help you navigate your sex life, your relationship, your intimacy, the whole shebang. We can't get to you because we get erased, we get banned, we get muted, we get stripped of any kind of way of approaching you. Even emails. Email used to be safe. Not anymore. No. Not anymore. So we can't even connect with you via email. When you have signed up, our emails go into your spam box. So what are we left with? That's a good point. I, I subscribe to a lot of newsletters of guests that I've had, and they go right to my, right to my uh, spam or my promotions. Yeah. They don't go to my inbox. That's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that, but very true. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's funny because you see it in life like physical life, right? With the laws that are being enacted and not just in the States, but really everywhere. But then you also see it online. A lot of this information, good sex ed, how babies are made. A lot of people think that you cannot get pregnant when you're on your period. And so they, yeah. yeah and so they have sex or they think that you can't get pregnant from pre-cum and you, you can, it's, it's less likely, but you, you can. And so there are these myths rolling around in the world, which if somebody just like did a Google search or had the right education in the first place, that misinformation wouldn't be out there. Mm. But there's, there's a lot more around um, sex education and, and actually having a fulfilling sex life. Because having a fulfilling sex life is not just about knowing how you can get pregnant or not. It's about feeling good about sex, feeling good in your body, feeling connected with your partner, being able to relax, tell your fantasies and whatnot. And a lot of that is just so impossible for a lot of people because of guilt and shame. And this guilt and shame, again, is enacted in the silence there is around sex and relationships. As I said, right. anything can become taboo. You put it, you put shame, guilt around it, you silence it, it becomes a taboo. People don't want to talk about it. I mean, people feel uncomfortable talking about, I don't know, the, I don't know, Hitler. You know, nobody's naming their child Adolf Hitler, you know. <laughs> Why? Because it's, it wasn't great, you know, what this guy did. And it's immediately just connected to shame, to guilt, to negative feelings, and we just shut the topic. And that's what's happening in sex and relationships. People don't understand how insane it is to be engulfed in this kind of shame culture and how much it's shooting you in the dick mm -hmm. when it comes to your sex life. For instance, one of the things that I keep saying to men is like, if you have negative ideas about women's sexuality and you're really quick to jump to uh, slut shame, Trust me, you're not going to have the best sex of your life with women because they'll be too concerned about being too wild with you and slut shamed. Because if you talk about another woman, like, oh, look at her, how she's dressed. What a slut. She slept with Jimmy and Johnny and whatever. What a slut. She's not going to your partner that's there, right next to you, listening to the fucked up shit you're saying about other women she's not gonna tell you what kind of fantasies she has or who she has slept with or be extra wild with you or dress in a particular way even for you just in case you deem her a slut she's gonna internalize everything that you're saying yeah and she'll be afraid to be a sexual being mm -hmm. yeah this idea that sex is only for procreation i mean there's like you know the the red pill movement out there which are like Guys who are like, oh, you know, purity culture, only sleep with women who have had less than five partners or something like that. You know, and it's just like, 
okay, but what about you? Mm. How many partners have you had? <laughs> oh, 53? Oh, okay. So, so why is that okay for, for you to do that, but not for me? And it's, it's about this idea of what womanhood is supposed to look like, um, which is outdated and has always been bullshit, but it is, it is what it is, I suppose. Um, so along the ideas of censorship, I was reading your like pre-interview sheet and some of the things, what are some of the things that we are missing out on because of censorship? What are some of the new, you, you talked about uh, sex tech and femtech in, in your pre-interview sheet. And I was like, oh, I don't, I've never, I know what those things are, I guess, but like, I've never heard those terms used. There are so many cool things that we're not getting access to. Like, what are some of those things that those cutting edge things that are out there that we just aren't seeing? Well, it's a, it's a lot that you're not seeing and the average person would not see because of censorship online. So I'm in those circles and I see amazing products and services being built. Every freaking week I receive newsletters and whatnot with this is a new development in femtech or sex tech, etc. And I'm continuously amazed at what is happening in these two industries. And yet I know that the majority of people would not have heard these terms. And even if they can really benefit from these services and products, they do not hear about them and the advertising that these companies are trying to do is nowhere near reaching them um there's a lot in femtech around um female health specifically around um menopause right now things are exploding yes mm -hmm. and a lot of men who have been through the period of menopause with their partner can tell you how difficult this is for them as well to, to go through uh, with your partner, to be witnessing the suffering, to be going through your own dry spell and frustration that your partner is just not well and not able to spare the capacity to think of you, not to mention sleep with you. Yeah. And yet these kind of companies that are developing amazing products that relieve pain or um, research even that's being done to investigate what is happening in the female body, why are we getting these kind of uh, reactions and how we can elevate the pain, the hot flashes, the blah, blah, blah. They're not reaching women. And therefore, again, men are impacted. Mm -hmm. When it comes... And there are so many cool things too that are coming. I, I talked with somebody maybe last year um, who created a patch that goes on the perineum mm -hmm. that sends electrical impulses and can help to um, help men like last a little bit longer, maintain an erection a little bit easier. And it's like, th there are things happening that can help men too, oh, yeah. but you're not like, you're not hearing about that either. I mean, I, I tell people, they're like, oh, what's like one of the wildest episodes that you've recorded? And I'm like, well, that one, I just think that's so interesting and, and a cool product. Um, but are we... Are we hearing about it? No. The product is more, by the way, yeah, for anybody Jeff. who's wondering. M-O-R. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. I know who <laughs> nice you're talking guy. about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I've had meetings with him. He's creating something amazing. And again, you know, these kind of products will just not reach you. Will just not reach you because these companies have a hard time advertising. Even if with everything that you do, Google search, etc., the algorithms should point you to this. They are not. So I know if I was looking for, I don't know, a freaking Hoover or a new car, I would be chased around the internet by companies that want to sell me a car or oh, Hoover absolutely. or something like this. But not the same with sex. If you look through my search history for, from, for the browser that I run, the sexual business community and even my business, you would see so much about sex and relationships. Do you know what kind of ads I see? Nothing related to sex. Nothing related Cars to... Cars and Hoovers, yeah. yeah. I still see the Hoover. <laughs> if I've done one <laughs> search for like five minutes to buy a new Hoover, I'll still be like chased around the internet by, you know, Amazon links and Google whatever advertisements for Hoovers. But I don't see 
anything around sex and relationships. And if you look at my search history, if you look at what I'm like, what are the websites that I'm engaging with? What are the newsletters that I'm subscribed to? You should think that if you open my computer, all the freaking adverts that you would see should be for menopause or for um, erections or for pleasurable sex or whatever. None of that. None of that. It's wild. Like, and you see, it's funny because you know where you do see those things? Pornhub. Yeah. <laughs> and not all of it is. Most of it is not real. even health related. Most of it is related yeah. to just like watch <laughs> Granny's Bank or something. Um, <laughs> right. Or like, you know, the, the penis sleeve, which, you know, I had never heard of before, but I saw that on on. Pornhub and I was like oh okay but a lot of it is kind of about like how to make your dick bigger or like yeah. how to last longer which like hey I get it that's what that's what people with penises are concerned about when it comes to the realm of sex and there are things out there that can help you but you're not seeing them you're not getting the access to them no. what can we do to fight this what can we do to a what's what are some tips and tricks to actually act access this material that people might want to find and b what can we do to actually make sure that this material is front and center that we can prioritize it more and fight the censorship that the the sex and wellness industry is is dealing with mm. well i will answer the second one first um there are organizations and uh institutions and companies that are really trying hard to fight censorship one that comes to mind is the Center for Intimacy Justice. They're doing amazing work, and I would highly recommend people to go and check out what they're doing um, because it's important, because they're laboring so hard to fight for our uh, access to materials, to healthcare, to everything without censorship, without um, drama for those people that are trying to create something that works for for people and is helpful so yes the center for intimacy justice is one place that i would recommend people go and check out donate to them support them in any possible way spread their word because this is something that you can do right now to fight that injustice support these kind of organizations and on the topic of what i'm doing aside of reaching out to organizations like the center of intimacy justice and saying to them i want to support you i want to spread the word for you etc is that i'm creating um, a platform for so to speak the connecting of the general public to the sex and relationship professionals coaches therapists experts in general who can give you that resource uncensored unfiltered and help you navigate sex and relationships with ease that's going to be like a hub where you can go and find trusted information directly from professionals and you wouldn't you wouldn't be finding it difficult to find exactly what you need from that platform and the platform if you're interested is called life's explicit because life is explicit because life and sex are just you know together they go together there's no life without sex right and what we talk about is explicit so lifesexplicit.com go visit the website find what you need be it a professional for one-to-one -one sessions or resources courses whatever it is a community even that is sex positive and would support you through your journey that's awesome i i okay i finally found it i i googled a life's explicit and life explicit came up <laughs> well that's because we are still working on the seo and the whole thing so, yeah. <laughs> but it's also a great example yeah. to show why this is an issue and why why this uh, what, what happens yeah. it's uh very frustrating but yeah i just i just pulled it up because i'm gonna be spending some time on there oh yeah this is super cool so when are you planning on launching this? It will be launched in the summer. Um, okay. June, July time. Um, I'm not sure when this episode is going up, but um, people can sign up and uh, 
be the first to learn when we launched. There'll be a lot of um, work that we'll do to do PR, etc. But again, censorship, these news may not reach you, depending on how these, um, you know, media companies and whatnot title these articles. So we'll see. But my point is, if you want to be the first to hear, if you want to be the first on the news of when we have upcoming events, if you want to subscribe to certain topics that you're interested in, in be it health and sex or perinatal or BDSM or Tantra, whatever it is that floats your boat, you can visit our website, sign up to the newsletter, explore and find what, what you need, basically. Yeah, because we're all, there's always something, right, in your in your intimate or your personal life that you might need help with. And to have a database of information, to have people that you can reach out to if you have questions or if you want to, if you want to sign up for like sex therapy of some kind mm -hmm. to talk through some of these things or some of these blocks that you might have. Because like we were saying at the beginning, sex is something that everybody, most people do. And it's why we're all here. So why aren't we prioritizing it the same way that we're prioritizing? You have to have, in the States, a different kind of insurance for your teeth. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> like it's completely separate insurance just for your teeth. So uh, why, like, I'm always like, why can't I have like a separate mental health insurance, you know, or why are we prioritizing certain things and not others? Because sexual health is health. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think we need to start looking at it that way. Absolutely. And so much of your sexual well-being is impacting your relationships, the quality of your life. We know that people who have more sex that's more pleasurable are happier. They show up at work happier. They're more productive. They're more inspired. Are you kidding me? Like a few years ago, I got asked to do a talk at a local networking event for small businesses in Oxfordshire, UK, where I am. And um, my talk was titled something along the lines of why you, you should give a shit about your employees' sex life. Mm, and, ooh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, and I basically argued the point that if you do care about your employee's sex life and, and you invest in it, it would be a great, there would be a great return on your investment. Um, because the happy employees that have a great relationship at home come at work and can focus on work you know they're not thinking how horny they are or how much um, drama there was last night with their spouse because of xyz they can just be happy turn up at work do their best work go home and continue being happy go have some sex go, go have some good healthy sex at home yeah, yeah. but <laughs> my point is Companies should invest in the relational and sexual happiness of their employees because do I need to remind people how so many companies were freaking out during the pandemic that employees were wanking during working hours? <laughs> do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. Let them. Let them wank one out because then they will show up and be more centered and do the work. Yeah. You know? It's a stress relief. Exactly. Exactly. Like, let, like, yeah, let them and like, I do think a lot of people are like, they, a lot of people liked the idea of getting paid while they were doing that. Sure. Which like, I can't, I, I can't, I can't argue with that. It is pretty, a pretty funny idea. Sure. But in the same time, <laughs> after you wank one out for the majority of people, you don't feel so distracted. Now it's, mm -hmm. you know, you're more relaxed. You're more like capable of focusing on that email to that bitch from i don't know sales <laughs> or whatever um marketing sheila and marketing or whatever yeah, exactly <laughs> sorry sheila i don't know <laughs> i don't know a sheila and marketing <laughs> just to throw that out there it's just a random name i came up yeah. with <laughs> but the point is um there is so much health wealth and happiness when our mm -hmm. relationships are thriving when our intimate life is fulfilling so if you want to make an investment in that part of your life absolutely go ahead you know find that resource that you need on life's explicit don't delay life is too short you know and and we're doing our best to fight censorship um 
But if you can help us spread the word as well, tell your friends, tell your parents, tell your colleagues, etc. Let's let's do it together. As I said, help the Center for Intimacy Justice. Help us spread the word. Let's help more people be happy and fulfilled. At the end of the day, that's what matters. Mm. Amazing. Leah, are there any other places that people can find you, that they can connect with you, that they can connect with Life's Explicit? Are you on social media? Where where uh, can people reach out? If people want to reach out directly to me, they just need to Google my name. I'm very Googleable. And that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm mostly on LinkedIn. Um, but if people are interested in having a session with me or something, they would just need to Google my name. They'll find my website and they can sign up for a free discovery call um, and we'll take it from there. But yeah, it's so easy to find me online. Just Google Leah Spasova. You would find me easily. Awesome. Leah, thank you so much for coming on here today and sharing. It's been an honor to meet you after, you know, talking with you for the last couple of years behind the scenes. And uh, I'm so excited for Life's Explicit and what it has to offer and for everything that you're doing here to fight censorship. So thank you so much for coming on and talking about it today. Thanks for having me, Rachel. It's been a blast. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. You have been listening to Wine, Dine, and 69. I am your host, Rachel Dalton, and let's keep talking.